Hello and welcome to this edition of the Wireless Land News Desk. My name is Tom Carpenter. I'm the CTO at CWNP and this is the News Desk for March 2nd, 2018. We have a few things to cover in the news this week. First of all, this week here at CWNP, we announced the location and dates for the Wi-Fi Trek Conference this year. The dates are going to be October 14th to the 16th for the pre-conference training classes. There will be several of those. And then October 17th to the 19th for the conference sessions. So the conference alone will be October 17th through the 19th, but the pre-conference training will begin on October 14th. And the much awaited location will be in San Diego, California this year. So in October, it's always a great time to go to San Diego. We're looking forward to the conference this year. Several announcements will be coming out in the upcoming months about the schedule and the plan for the event and so forth. And we're very excited about it. First of all, there's going to be a keynote of a very technical nature that will be presented at the conference to launch things this year. And we're very excited about that. We're going to do something very special at the conference with CWS and CWT, so look for announcements about that as well. So there are some really exciting, great things happening for this year's conference. Now also in the news, ghost frames, or poltergeist frames, or CCI. Well, a blog post by Ben Miller started discussions of what he calls ghost frames and what I, with my West Virginia attempted humor, call poltergeist frames. And the reason for that, by the way, is poltergeist comes from the German poltern, which means noisy, and geist meaning ghost, so it means a noisy ghost. So you've got ghosts and you've got noisy ghosts. So I suggest a poltergeist frame is the kind we're talking about because they're noise to the devices. The devices hear that noise and know that they cannot talk. Well, more about that as we go along. At the WLPC conference a couple of weeks ago, there was a big discussion among several wireless experts about this concept of ghost frames and its impact on wireless LAN design and so forth. Out of that discussion, a blog was created by Devin Aiken, and this blog covers the details of what Ben Miller's describing as ghost frames and what they mean in 802.11 wireless networks. Both of their blogs are well worth a read. I've linked to Ben and Devin's blogs in the description below for this video. So make sure you take a look at those if you haven't seen them before. Additionally, there's a link to Ben's WLPC presentation on ghost frames at YouTube. It's a video there. So you want to take a look at all of those extra resources. But what I want to do is step back and say, how has CWNP dealt with this concept that is being addressed here? We've already dealt with it for well over two years now in our various materials, CWDP materials, uh, CWNA, CWS, CWT, it's dealt with in there, but we don't call them ghost frames or poltergeist frames. Uh, what we talk about is CCI, co-channel interference, and explain the important thing you need to understand when, for example, disabling low data rates. So let's start with what does that even mean, disabling low data rates. There are in your configuration interfaces options for basic rates and supported rates. Sometimes those basic rates are called mandatory rates. That's not an 802.11 term. In 802.11, there is the term mandatory rates, but mandatory rates are those that are required for a device to be that kind of device. So what I mean is, for example, with 802.11G, if it's going to be an 802.11G device, it has to support 1, 2, 5.5, 11, 12, 18, and 24 megabits per second. It can't get by with not supporting those. So th those are some of the mandatory rates. Uh, 54 megabits per second was not a mandatory rate. So it had to support those. Now, we really don't see 11G or 11A devices that don't support 54 megabits per second in any real large scale deployment, but those are mandatory rates according to the standard. In addition, the standard defines data rates in the beacon frame of the AP. So the beacon frame can say, here are the data rates that I support. Those data rates are each defined by a byte, eight bits, zero to seven. The seventh bit, also called the most significant bit, is set to one when it's what we call a basic rate and zero when it's a supported rate. So what's the difference between a basic rate and a supported rate? A basic rate is required to connect. If you don't support that basic rate as a device, you can't connect to the BSS. The supported rate is a nice to have. If you support them, you can use them. So the AP supports them. If the client supports it, they can both be used. 
So basic versus supported rates. And again, it's that most significant bit, the seventh bit that determines that one basic zero supported. Now, with that said, why do we need these basic rates? Why do we need rates that are required to be supported to participate in the BSS? Because those rates are the rates that your management frames and control frames and these types of frames will go at. So uh, think about RTS, CTS frames, things like that, that everybody needs to be able to process in the BSS. Okay. So if one megabits per second is your lowest basic rate, that may be the rate that these frames go out at. So they're not going to go out at 54 megabits per second because everyone needs to be able to demodulate an RTS frame, for example, for it to really effectively do its job. If you want to know more about RTS frames, of course, we cover it in our CWNA materials and you'll want to make sure you dive deep there to learn more about that. Now, back to this ghost frame issue, now that we've talked a little bit about basic and supported rates. The concept of the ghost frame issue is really just highlighting co-channel interference, CCI, and what is going on with that. When a station sees a frame above a certain threshold for a physical layer, it has to acknowledge that that frame is communicating and not communicate itself on the medium. So it sees the frame, it doesn't communicate. What is it looking at? Well, here's the important thing to understand. When a frame is transmitted on the network, you have two general things that are being transmitted. You have the MAC layer frame. This is called the MPDU. It's prepared by the MAC layer and sent down to the physical layer. The MPDU is the payload for 802.11. Then at the physical layer, we create what you could call a phi frame. It has a PLCP header, the physical layer convergence protocol header. It has this header that goes on it. And then there are preambles or training fields that go before it. So here's the thing. Because we have mixed environments today where you have an 802.11n 2.4 gigahertz AP that still supports 11G and 11B for backward compatibility, we have protection elements that are included in the frame headers. This is true in 5 gigahertz as well. So we've got 802.11ac still needs to support 11n and 11a. So what we can do in those mixed environments is we can send something that all 802.11a devices or all 802.11 devices can understand in the early part of the communication. And then we can send things still in the phi portion that only an 11G device could understand, for example, or an 11N device or an 11N or AC device in five gigahertz. So in the phi portion, there are portions that are sent at the lowest data rate in the band depending on certain factors, that's one or two megabits per second in 2.4 gigahertz and six megabits per second in five gigahertz. And then there are portions that can be sent at different rates. Uh, so the data portion, the payload, what's coming from the Mac layer is what's sent at the data rate. Therefore, when you see in a protocol capture or you're just looking on your MacBook at the data rate that frames are going out at, or if you look at NetSH in Windows and you see the RX and TX data rates, those are the data rates that the actual Mac layer payload is sent at. That's not the data rate that the phi information is sent at. It's sent at a much lower data rate and can be modulated by all of the different stations that are participating in that BSS. This concept then of being able to demodulate the phi information, but not the Mac information is what Ben Miller has called ghost frames. And what we call it here at CWNP is an association boundary and a CCI boundary or contention boundary. So the association boundary is the boundary at which clients can associate to the BSS based on their ability to achieve a minimum data rate. So let's say I've disabled six megabits per second and that's all in five gigahertz. They'll have to be able to do nine megabits per second to be able to connect. Therefore, nine megabits per second is my association boundary, but six megabits per second is my CCI boundary, although it's really more than that, depending on how the chipset actually looks at signal strength and so forth. So the point is that, however, there is a boundary at which I have to acknowledge a frame that I have heard, even though I can't really participate in relation to demodulating the Mac layer information and may not be able to connect to the BSS that that frame was transmitted as a part of. So it's transmitted as part of a BSS I may not even be in, but I have to acknowledge it because I can demodulate that phi header. It's above my threshold for an 802.11 frame and I've got to acknowledge that. 
that's my CCI or my contention boundary, meaning I have to factor that into my contention algorithm as a client device and decide whether I can connect or not and actually transmit, I should say. And I can't transmit because I have to acknowledge that. So this is the issue that they're talking about here. So the basic rates configuration for your AP ends up defining in effect generally where that association boundary is versus the CCI or contention boundary. So the CCI or contention boundary with low data rates disabled is always farther from the AP than the association boundary. So the association boundary comes in closer to the AP as we disable more and more lower data rates. And it goes out farther from the AP as we enable more and more lower data rates. So if all data rates are enabled, effectively your association boundary and your CCI contention boundary are relatively the same. Though again, there can be factors that still make them vary a bit, but generally speaking, we can just say that they're the same to keep our discussion simple here today. But when you start disabling low data rates, it's different. Now, it's the beacon frame that sets those basic rates and then it's the physical layers and the band in which the communications are happening, 2.4 versus five gigahertz, that impacts the speed at which the phi portion is sent. So we're talking about, remember, uh, preambles or training fields and the PLCP header. That information goes at one rate, the actual payload goes at another. Now, when would that be different? Well, let's say that you're so far out on the cell edge that six megabits is supported by the BSS and all you can do is six megabits per second. Well, then your phi information and the payload is going to go at six megabits per second. In that case, it's the same. It's consistent across the board. But generally speaking, most of the stations in the BSS are going to have something better than six megabits per second uh, in their capability. So what's going to happen is those stations are actually going to send the phi information at six megabits per second, and then they'll ramp up the data rate and the modulation used for the actual payload, possibly to hundreds of megabits per second. So it's important to understand that that is a reality in the environment. And the way it impacts your networks is contention. So the cell might be a certain size from the perspective of connected and communicating stations in that BSS, but the impact of that cell can be much larger even when you disable low data rates. The disabling of low data rates is done to try to encourage clients to get out of the BSS and move to another BSS instead of dropping down to those lowest of all data rates. That's the whole point of disabling low data rates, or at least the major reason for doing it. But that doesn't change the CCI or contention boundary of that cell. And that's so important to keep in mind. And remember the CCI or contention boundary of the cell is not just driven by the AP, but take a client that's at the edge of the association boundary. That client is also going to radiate out omnidirectionally in most cases, right? And so it extends that boundary even further out where people hear the frames, devices hear the frames, people hear the frames from that client and they have to acknowledge that and not communicate. So this is all very important. Of course, we cover this uh, in our CWS and CWT at a basic level. In CWNA, it's more advanced. In CWDP, it's more advanced. And of course, in the new CWDP and CWAP, it'll be even more advanced in its discussion still. So we do cover these concepts, but remember, we refer to it as the association boundary and the CCI or contention boundary. And they're very important to consider when you're designing your wireless LAN. It's a real part of the way 802.11 works. It's the way it should work. We need to think about how it impacts our design procedures and how it impacts our uh, network functionality after implementation. It's not a new thing, so the, the naming it ghost frames or poltergeist frames doesn't make it a new thing, but it is a very important thing to understand just about the way 802.11 operates. You want to get into the nitty gritty details of the different data rates for the Phi portion versus the Mac portion and so forth. Take a look at Devin's blog. He went into great details there. You want to get Ben Miller's perspective on it. Make sure you take a look at his blog as well. Okay, we're going to wrap up with one more piece of news, the latest news about 11AX. And this isn't brand new this week, but I want to make sure you're aware of what's going on with 802.11AX. In uh, May of 2019, we are now expecting the sponsor ballot. So based on the fact that draft one and draft two were not approved. So draft two got 60 something percent of the vote. It's not enough for it to be approved to go to the sponsor ballot. And that caused further changes that need over 3,000 
comments were made that need to be addressed and evaluated. Then there'll be another vote again. The goal right now is May of 2019 for the sponsor ballot. Now to put that in perspective, several months after that is when we would technically call it ratified. It could be as late as late 2019 now. So keep that in mind as we're seeing that AX pre-standard chips are coming out. Um, they're there, sure, but it's important to know that the standard still has some evolution to go through. So 11AX, sometime in 2019, we had hopes that maybe late 2018, early 2019, we would see it. It's looking more like third or fourth quarter 2019 now. That can all still change, but I just wanted to update you on where things are at this point in time. Well, that's it for the news desk this week. Thanks a lot for joining me. Hope you've got some good information out of it. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and you can click the bell so you can be notified about postings and new information that we provide on the CWNP TV YouTube channel. Thanks a lot for joining us and I'll see you next week.